thank you, Pastor Bill. And uh, and if if my voice goes, it's not because I've preached the message twice already. It's because I've been staying up late, yelling at the TV screen, watching uh, watching Chris and Paul uh, get home in the volleyball. I just I just love it. And uh, and we are we are unpacking a, in the for the next few weeks, spending time around the concept of of work, of what what we do when we're not in this building. Uh, doing doing the the thing of the Christian faith within the building, we're saying, hey, ha, this is there is so much more to the Christian life than than just singing and sitting and listening. That in fact, there's this whole huge part of our life that God has a calling, a kingdom calling. Hey, kingdom calling for our life, and I think He's wanting to speak into all areas of our life and get us excited for what is possible when he, when he really grabs hold of the reins of our life. And I think there's some significant things uh, in, in store. Do you believe that? Yeah. In fact, I'd love just to pray. Um, just, you don't have to stand up. Just, I, I'm just wanting to pray and invite us into a journey over the next few weeks of God really speaking, God really directing, God really empowering, um, that He would use us for His kingdom in a really significant way. Uh, even more than he has in the past. So why don't you join together and pray. Father, we just thank you that we see in the Bible from start to finish that you've chosen ordinary people to do extraordinary things for you. And Lord, we just we put ourselves in that position and we say, Lord, would you use us in that way? Lord, with our own skills and abilities, with our uh, limitations, with our strengths and with, it, with our weaknesses, Lord, we wanna put those before you and we just want our life to matter for the glory of God. So we just pray that you would speak to us and direct us and empower us and take us to where we need to be for you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, work, what we do with our hands and what we do for work really matters, really matters. In fact, the average person uh, spends approximately 150,000 hours at work in their lifetime, doing paid or voluntary work, caring or raising children, and whatever it be in that work sphere, uh, what we do really matters. That is, 40% of our waking hours are spent in some sort of work. So what we do with our time really matters. And I think that sometimes we can think that God is interested just with the reading the Bible bits of our life, the coming into a church building part of our life, uh, those things that seem directly spiritual. But in fact, God is so interested in our work life and what we do with our time really matters. Um, Ephesians 2.10 uh, talks about that God has a plan for our work life, that He has a plan for all of our life and speaks this over us that uh, tells us the good news of the gospel of where we were before Christ and then the good news of what Jesus has done for us and then in verse 10, it says, for we are God's handiwork. Um, I prefer the trans translation that says masterpiece because when I'm, when, I, when I'm feeling a bit low or when I've got pimples all over my faces, I, I wanna get up in the morning and look into the mirror and just remind myself that I'm God's masterpiece. Even though what is on the outside doesn't always reflect that, but I'm, hold on to the Word of God, in Jesus' name. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to what? To do good works. This is of course not just talking about labour, but talking about good deeds that He prepared in advance for us to do. But wrapped up in, in this passage, as it's talking about the Gospel, as not only being something that comes to bring us forgiveness and deal with the sin issue in our life, but part of the good news of Jesus is that we are redeemed from our old life of living life for ourselves and for the kingdom of darkness, but now we actually have a, this incredible purpose. Uh, we have a master and now we also have a mission. And, and, and there is something for us to do. So that, that is good for us to know because sometimes we just end up in this life just saying, oh Lord Jesus, just take me home. And we just think, we think, oh, when, when I get to heaven, 
that's where the real, the real Christian stuff is gonna happen. And, and before then, it's just kind of waiting around, uh, looking at the watch and uh, doing all the mundane things. And, but that is not the biblical story. The biblical story and the good news of the gospel is that God, eternity starts now that we have good works to do now. And not only do we have things to do now, but that there's things that we do that won't pass away because God is redeeming, restoring and renewing creation. So what we do with our work life and what we do in all parts of our life actually has eternal significance. That it won't just all burn up. In, in, in fact, in Psalm 90, there's a repeated uh, prayer that, um, that Moses says that, Lord, establish the work of my hands. He's talking about life is short, life is fleeting, life can be meaning, meaningless, but there is something about what I do in the kingdom, what I do for God that actually has lasting effects. Establish the work of my hands. So God has important things for you to do. And, uh, and one of the books, uh, there was three books I'd love to recommend to you that, that I've been reading in preparation for this series. Uh, one of them is by Amy Sherman and the book is called Kingdom Calling, uh, which is the same of course as our series, which talks about stewarding our vocations uh, for God in the world for, for good, for common good, but also for God. And it talks, it picks up this, this image of what, church, a church gathering should be all about. Uh, and, and it compares two things. It says it shouldn't be like a cruise ship where, where people come together for a relaxing time to you know, be sipping on a, on a margarita, having some dim sims. I don't know what, you, I've never been on a cruise ship, so, but I assume they have quite a few <laughs> things to eat, including dim sims. But it's not just coming together for a relaxing time, the, the church gatherings shouldn't be like a, a cruise ship, it should be like an aircraft carrier where, where the aircraft um, come in, they get refuelled, they get, um, get given their mission and then they get launched out into where they need to go. And I just love that, that, that that's why we gather together. And sometimes um, it, it can feel like in church that we're always banging on about your, your personal relationship with Jesus. And, and we're talking about the importance of prayer, reading your Bible reading, getting, being renew, renewing your mind, all that kind of thing. You think, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with a lot of things because if we are not closely and intimately and continually connected with our Master, we're never gonna step into our right mission. And then if we're not uh, connected with the Master, uh, abiding in Him, uh, bearing good fruit and, and being reminded of our biblical mandate, we're not connected with our mission and, and whatever we're doing, we're not gonna be doing it with the right motivation. So those three M's of our calling, Master, Mission and Motivation are so important for us to be stepping into the calling and the purpose that God has for us. And in fact, this Christian life and what we do with our time was never meant to be independent of God. And we see that in the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus' marching orders and instructions to the disciples before He went to be ascended, went to, to um, back to heaven. And, and He gives them the Great Commission that you, that you know about. It's talking about go into all the world and make disciples teaching them to obey all that I've commanded, baptising them, that idea of spiritually forming people and, and, and preaching the gospel and directly preaching about Jesus. And we see what that is like. The, the very words co-mission tell you about the way you're meant to do it, not just what you're meant to do. It's a co-mission, it's a partnership. It's never meant to be something that you, all right, I'm gonna go do the Jesus thing now, I'll check back in at the end of my life. No, it's, it's with Jesus. And everything that we do in the Christian life is meant to be intimately connected to Him. Um, on Wednesdays, I, uh, I get some, some child-free time to, to study and to take, take my daughter Abby, who's now five, to the grandparents' place uh, down in Semaphore. And, uh, and what I love that they often do on a Wednesday is they, they bake together. And, and, oh, praise God, biscuits, honey crackles, cakes, I don't really care what it is, but I just want them to bring it home to me afterwards. 
And so, so now it's got to the point where I'll like actually give the instruction. Like, Abby, just make sure, whatever, I don't care what you do with grandma and grandpa, just make sure you bring some baking home for me because that's important. But what I love is when she comes home after having a great time at the end of the day and she comes home with a container of things. Daddy, look what I baked. And that's her response. Look what I have made. But of course, I know the real scenario is that Abby probably under heavy supervision probably did some mixing, maybe did some rolling out, but that was about it. <laughs> my, my mum and dad did all the rest of the hard work making sure the right amount of things went in, that, that the things were safe, that the ingredients were out, that it wouldn't have actually happened without them. But this is a kind of a picture that just like my parents allowed Abby into this process of making something and having this sense of, I made this, I was a part of contributing towards this. This is the picture that we get of, of the Christian life as well, that, that Jesus invites us and, and it's a beautiful, it's amazing. This is how humble God is, that He, he allows really f- foolish and feeble people like us to be involved with what He's doing on the earth. And, and it's just such a privilege and he says, with the great commission, we're gonna do this together. You are gonna be responsible for sharing and for showing the world what I'm like. And as a part of doing that, it's not just the overtly Christian stuff of the great commission, that is one of our callings. And no matter what we're doing in our life, we, we are gonna stand before Jesus and, and give an account for what we've done in the body. Not, not whether we are saved or not, um, because we know that if we're in Jesus, that our eternity is secured. It's not, our, it's not our performance and our effort that guarantee our salvation and our eternity with Him. But we're still gonna be asked what we did while we were in the body. And so there's this sense of how have I, as a Christian, outworked the Great Commission? And that's a great question. How am I contributing towards discipleship? That calling that in the church, that Christian calling of how am I building other people up, training other people for Jesus, sharing my faith, all that kind of thing. We have a kingdom calling to do those things. I wonder where is that present and how is that present? I'm sure it's present, but it's good to know. And maybe that there's some things that have slidden off or just been off the radar that needs to, God's just gonna say over the course of this series, hey, I've called you to this. Don't forget your mission. I'm wanting to launch you out like, like a, a beautiful jet um, with, a, with a mission to, to see great things happen. But not only the Great Commission, before the Great Commission, there was the, what's called the Adamic Mandate, um, which was God's instruction to the first humans to partner with Him in creating culture, in, in working for the common good, in reflecting he, Himself as the first worker, as we see that, of course, that Creator God taking, as described in Genesis, as that which was formless and void, that was waste and wild, something that wasn't useful or beautiful, that, that God, with His creative power, makes it into something beautiful and also something useful and habitable for humanity. And, and, and we see in Genesis 1 that God then extends uh, this, gives authority and gives a blessing to the first humans to partner with Him in that same work. And, uh, and we read it together as we pick up in Genesis 1. It says this, So God created man in His image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. We see... Then that God blessed them, that He put His stamp of approval on them. He gave them the green light. He gave them responsibility and ownership. And He said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. We can hear things like subdue and dominion and the words rule, as it says in some translations, and, and we can see, seem like that seems like pretty heavy handed. But all this is saying is that the, these are functions of a king and of a ruler that, that were, that, that this is God's job. This is what God is doing. And he's saying, I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. And, and he says to Adam in chapter two, he says, um, Stuart, tend, tend over the garden." have stewardship over it. And the, you see, is this, this beautiful gift of work 
that as we do, as we go into the world, as we contribute to society, as we labour, as we think, as we create, as we, as we do all the different things that we do as part of our paid or unpaid work, that it's saying in this passage that what we do when we do that, those things is we reflect the image of God. In the, in the leadership community or the business sector, there's this concept called um, the mission drift where they talk about how over time through the, the pressures and the demands of, of work life that, that the core mission statement or the driving force of the why behind an organisation can, can leak or get lost. And we too in our Christian life need to learn how to avoid the mission's drift. Um, where we need to stay connected to why, why am I doing what I'm doing and who am I doing it for? Um, Harv, there was a couple of examples that I found of, of this, this idea of missions drift that Harvard University, which was established in, I think, 1645, which started out, um, their, their mission statement was preparing um, ministers for the work of the Lord. Um, something along those lines. Of course, that is not what they do now. Over, over the, the, those years, it's become, it's become something that it wasn't intended to be in, in many ways. And, and, and they're essentially, their mission drifted. Uh, the other example more recently was a company that only some of you would probably be aware of, an uh, American clothing com- company called American Apparel, which started out um, with a really noble mission driving force was that they wanted to bring manufacturing jobs back into the US rather than outsourcing it to uh, international places. And and so that was the heartbeat of the the company. But then over the years, um, for whatever reason, the mission shifted and what they became known for was highly cheap and sexualized advertisements to sell their products. And, and what, is, what happened, that there was a mission drift that they lost sight of, of their core and the why, why we got into this, why we started, why are we, doing, why are we really doing what we're doing? And as a result, only a few years ago, um, they went bankrupt and, and their store that was down in Rundle Street um, went, out of, went, went out of business. And uh, so the, what, what about you? Is your motivation and your mission strong in your life? with what you're doing, is it strong? Are you connected with it? Um, and, and we see, because we see in Romans 12, this idea that it's not just meant to be part of our life that is, is given to God, as Nick shared earlier, but it's all of our life. Let's read it together in Romans uh, chapter 12. After he shared the gospel, he says, therefore, in light of those things and what God's done, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of this mercy, to offer, to give, to dedicate your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Notice that word, worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and his perfect will. See, this is what we're talking about. When we're rightly connected with the master, then we'll be reacquainted with and have the right mission from out of that, then with the Lord's help that we'll have the right motivation. I love this quote from Abraham Kuyper who who speaks on this and writes on this topic of calling, who was both a pastor, but I think also the the leader, prime minister, whatever it is um, in the Netherlands was, took up that office and he says this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, mine. And we see this in the Psalms, it says, the earth is the Lord and everything in it. There's this sense in this series that God is calling us not to have a segmented life, a Sunday life, a, a, a life group life and then a devotion life and then a work life and a family life, all these different pockets that don't really touch each other. He's saying, oh, I want to come into all of those spaces. You were created to be an integrated person. And I wanna spend a few minutes talking about how out of Romans 12, this, this body living, living as a living sacrifice, this is your worship. In the Old Testament, this, the word for this is avodah, avodah. 
And in um, Romans 12, in the message, it sort of unpacks it into everyday language. And I like how it uh, comes out. It says this, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, offer it up, your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, here it is. You're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. So, so here's this concept of, of worship in the Old Testament, avodah. This idea of, if it's not just what's on your lips, it's not just what you do when you're in uh, the temple, the church building, it's, it's the practical stuff of life. This is what you're meant to do as your worship or, or what God is worth, your allegiance to Him should show itself and it should infiltrate all of your life. Let me share a few verses with you. Um, of this word avodah. In Exodus 34, it says this, six days you shall work, or avodah, um, that idea of, yeah, labour, and on the seventh day you shall rest. So it's clearly about what you're, what you're doing, contributing, labouring, working. And, but that, that word is not just a flat work or labour, it's that word avodah, which means worship that it's meant to be Godward. It's meant to be practical. It's meant to be for God, but also for the common good, but it is also for God. Don't forget that He's a part of it. And I think sometimes we can, we can get caught out and thinking, all right, when, when I go to uh, and serve in the kids' ministry, that's when I'm doing avodah. That's when I'm worshipping the Lord. That's when I'm doing ministry is when I um, go and pray for a person. And yes, that is true, but that's only part, only one side of it. There's this whole other part of your life that is ministry and that is worship. On six days you shall avodah. In Psalm 104 it says this, then a man goes out to his work or avodah, to his labour until evening. And here's some different translations all about the practical stuff of life during the Monday to Friday. This is what the Lord says. Um, in the Exodus story with Moses, let my people go so that they may worship me. That word avodah. And Joshua 24 puts it this way. It's the same word that's used for serve, is worship. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That God is calling uh, us to, to outwork our faith into every aspect of our life. And we get caught up in this secular, sacred divide and our lives get chopped up into all these different segments and pieces and the Lord's saying, no, just like the, Lord, the earth is mine and everything and every part of your life is mine. Romans 12, your whole life is a living sacrifice for me. I wanna come in. I want you to serve me. And this series is all about what that is like. It's not just about church work. And in Jeremiah 29, it's, uh, it was God's marching orders and instructions of how to outwork um, the faith of God's exiled community, where they were used to temple worship. They were used to a whole pattern and a system where, where of integrating their faith in, in all of their life. But now all of a sudden they find themselves in a culture that doesn't worship, is not set up for that. And so they, into that space, as they're trying to work out what does it look like to be faithful filled and faithful to God in this new environment where people don't believe what I believe. And that resonates with that where we are, isn't it? So this is helpful to us. And so they're trying to wrestle with this, but then God speaks into this and He says this to them. This is what the Lord of heaven armies, the God of Israel says to all the captives, He is exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. He says this, He doesn't say, gather together in a little huddle, and, and protect yourself and, and worship and, and, and be holy. He says this, build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens, eat the food they produce and work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray, for the, pray to the Lord for it and for its welfare. It, their welfare will determine your welfare. So he's saying the Christian life is not meant to be this insular thing of doing in church ministry. And, and it's not only, it is about that, but it's not only about that. And I think there's an equal challenge for each of us. If, if some of us are, are only thinking, all right, oh, 
the, the prayer and, and the in-church ministry is, is really all that's important in my life and the rest of it is just passing time. And then there's a challenge for us to go and bless the world. Go and show and share Jesus Christ to the world. Plant vineyards, this, this idea of go and work, go and, go and add to society. And there's so many people in our congregation like this who are doing this in your different professions, in your different work life, that you are working for the peace and the prosperity of the city. And that what you are doing matters to God. He wants you to do that. Because without people doing good things, if we're all pastors or missionaries, then our society would go down the toilet. We need Christians in every sector of, lo- of, of life and society doing good work. Even if the gospel's never shared, it's still good and it's still godly. However, we have that dual calling. We're, still, we're called to, sh- to show, but also we're called to share. And so the, for the, the challenge for some of us in the room today who really get this, I'm called to the peace and prosperity and, and to do that Adamic mandate of, of creating and working and labouring for God and for the common good. You get that bit and you're working, you're walking out your calling and you've discerned that and you've chosen a career path that is in line with the three things that Tim Keller talks about as how to discern your calling. The, the, what's, what are your abilities what, what are your affinities? That is the passions. What are you good at? What are you passionate about? And then what are your opportunities? Where are the needs around you? Is there a need and an avenue for, for you to express that? And he's saying, all right, many of you in the room have already done that and you've, you're doing that right now. But the challenge for you is not to neglect your, uh, the co-mission, the great commission, the in-church stuff. You, you're, you're doing a wonderful things in your careers you're getting high praise, you're, you're making a difference in the world, but where are you making disciples? Where, where are you con- directly contributing to, to that kind of thing? And I think we need to find a space and wrestle with that and, and ask God, where do you want me to be? How do you want me to prioritise my time? Where am I unbalanced in how I'm giving my thing? Because here's the thing, work was a gift in the garden, but sin also entered in. And the curse came upon our work. So as well as work being meaningful and giving us satisfaction, and because we know that, right, is that when, when we don't work, we kind of unravel and fall to pieces, that we need to be contributing, we need to be out working, we need to be busy people to be fully flourishing. But here's what can happen though, the curse came in and in Genesis 3 talked about the, there'll, be, there'll be toil and there'll be thorns and thistles There'll be, as well as life-giving aspects of work and hopefully a good paycheck, that there'll also be frustrations. There'll also be the opportunity to idolise work and for work to dominate over the other important things that God has called us to do and for work to be an end of itself and for us to lose the motivation and to be drifting from our mission. That because of sin and the inclination of our flesh, that work can sometimes get off track. And in this message today, we're reminded, hey, work is about, we need to, we are called to Avadah, the Lord. I might invite the band to come as we share a couple more thoughts and then we'll close. Um, at different times as part of my um, work that we talking with people, praying for people, helping them discern what, God has got next for them in their life. And, uh, and sometimes people will come and just share that what I'm doing right now, I really hate. <laughs> Has anyone, don't, maybe not if you're in that job or if, you're a, if your boss is in the room right now, maybe don't raise your hand, but have you ever worked a job that you just hated? I remember my first couple of jobs um, was, was a shelf stacker at Woolies. Praise God, there's dignity in that. But uh, it also wasn't a great job. <laughs> And my second job was, was cherry picking in the summer and labouring. And they were just tough jobs. They weren't, they weren't interesting jobs. They were just, they were just, it was just work. And, and sometimes people find themselves in this place of, I'm not particularly um, passionate. I don't have an affinity for what I'm doing. I don't feel like what I'm doing reflects how God has uniquely shaped me. And I want the cry of our heart should be, how can I be best used for God on this earth? 
Because what, like we said at the start, what we do matters. And so if, if that's happening, that happens with sometimes, sometimes people bring that tension and that struggle with me. And I'll say this to them, I say, life is too short to work all your days in a job that you hate. We spend 40% of our waking hours in that job. We shouldn't, we can't, <laughs> our work is too important to do something that is not meaningful, that isn't, doesn't shape up with how we are. And I guess we're not always in a position to be able to have choice over that, I understand that. But I think over the course of this series, God is calling us and speaking and saying, hey, not only are you called to work, but I have something, I have a deep calling on your life to make a difference in this world. And as the saying goes, that work, the work is what you're paid to do, but your calling is what you're made to do. And that God, as we said in Ephesians, He has prepared good works in advance for you to do. That there is a calling on your life that, is, that brings you alive, that gives, yes, there's gonna be thorns and thistles, but there are some things that God has for you that's going to bring you alive, give you satisfaction. And that's gonna benefit the church and it's gonna benefit the world. For some of us today, that means wrestling with the, with the real challenge of, all right, Lord, I'm not in the right place. I need to start praying. Lord, what do you have for me? Where are you leading me? And I'm reminded of the calling of, of Simon Peter to come and follow Jesus. As though he was doing one thing, he was a fisherman, but then Jesus came along and gave him an invitation to make a change. And he said, come follow me. And for some of us, we're gonna be faced with that same invitation that's gonna come with a big change. For Peter, that came with a loss of income. You think that fishing was his source of income. Fishing was his, he had, it was his comfortable space. He was trained in that area. And, and God's gonna call some people in the right time, maybe to a, a shift, a shift of career path. Something else that maybe has been, you've, you've hidden deep down within you for a, a long time that God's wanting to unearth it. Unearth your calling. I think of Michael Tompich, who, who shifted um, out of the industry he was in, into teaching. And for him, that was a massive financial sacrifice to, as, a, as a, a family man to go back into full-time study for four years. I think, man, our life is too short to live, to be doing things that we're not made to do, and just to doing them for a paycheck. We're called to more than that. Why don't we stand together if you're able? Maybe Jesus is saying, come follow me. Step into the uncomfortable space of change. Or maybe for many of us, You've chosen paths, you're in the right place perhaps, but you've lost the passion or you've lost the mission. That it's, your work has become about, it's no longer about Avodah, it's become about you, it's become about money, it's become about doing, doing it for the wrong reasons. And maybe over the, today and through the course of this series, God's wanting to bring you alive and saying there's so much more, there's so much more for you. Many years ago before Uber, I remember sitting in a taxi with a driver. I'll never forget it. At first I thought he was an angel because he talk, was talking about his job in a way that was so excited. It made me want to be a taxi driver. And he said, he, 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 said, he, said, he said, Sam, I'm not just here to drive people from one place to another. I'm here to take them to where they need to go. And he's saying, when people come into my taxi, sometimes what they need, they're exhausted. And so I just, put on some comforting music and I just, I just tell them to go, asleep in the back, go to sleep in the back seat and I just, I just let them be. Sometimes people come into the taxi and you can tell they're going through a really hard time. So I play the role of a counsellor and I ask them questions, I care about them, I try and impart some wisdom to them sometimes. And so he just said that what I'm doing is so much more than driving people. And when he was talking about this, I'm like, is this man a Christian? Is he an angel? I just felt so ministered to sitting to hear the purpose the deep and rich meaning that was far beyond the mechanics of what he did. There was a greater purpose to what he was doing. And then I realised he wasn't an angel because he swore a couple of times. I thought, nah, probably, 
I don't think, but even so, I was maybe still. <laughs> I think that's what God is calling us. There is so much, maybe it doesn't change what you do or who you're doing it for, but there's a greater purpose that's God saying, hey, I've put you on this earth. You are made in the image of God. You've got the great commission that God's Spirit is gonna come upon you. And you might say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a cleaner, I'm a student. I'm a, I'm a labourer, I'm, I'm, I'm in hospitality, I'm in retail. I'm like, I'll pray for you if you're in retail, that's hard work. But there's something encouraging that we get in the Bible, because do you know that, I think, it, I think this is right, in the first person for the Spirit of God to come upon them with power in the Old Testament wasn't a priest, wasn't a missionary, it wasn't someone who was preaching, it wasn't the worship leader. It was a craftsman. It was, it was an artisan. And his name was Bezalel, not Bezalbub. Sometimes it's in, we need to get that right. In Exodus 31, it says, as they were putting together the tabernacle, it says, I'll read it together. See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have, listen to this, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God with the ability and the intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. Notice what it's not saying. Notice what it's not empowering Him to do. It's practical service, practical talents, practical labour to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze. I don't know what you do in the room. Some of you, I know what you do. But I tell you, we need the Spirit of God to come upon us. We need to be connected to the greater purpose to see what we're doing and to say, I am doing this avodah, as my avodah, as my worship for God and for the common good. But I need the Holy Spirit to help me every day when I wake up. I'm not just going to drive a taxi. I'm going to take people where they need to go. And I need the Lord's help to do that. I wonder, would you close your eyes and bow your heads as we reflect on that and as we just open ourselves up to God stirring, to serve Him, to put ourselves back on the altar, not just my Sunday life, not just my church ministry, although maybe there'll be stirrings in that as well, but on what I do when I'm outside this building as living sacrifice as our worship to You, Lord. May our hearts cry be to be used powerfully, whatever we're doing. I wanna give an opportunity today, just for those who are responding to this message and saying, oh, I don't know exactly what it looks like yet, but I wanna have a line in the sand moment of saying, Lord, I am available to You. Maybe you've drifted in your mission and your work has become something other than what God's called it to be. Maybe you've lost the passion. Maybe you've become about a paycheck and God's been separate to it. God is stirring you to say, bring me back in there. I wanna do something for your job. And you're saying, yes, I wanna put put my work life back on the altar, Lord. Maybe for the other group of people, you don't know what it looks like yet, but you're saying, Lord, I'm inviting you to take me on a journey just like Simon Peter was saying, maybe there's somewhere else, maybe there's something else that I haven't been obedient to that you wanna take me. It it might involve sacrifice, it might involve a pay cut, it might involve something that doesn't make sense with natural reasoning. But Lord, I know that when I say yes to following You, it makes all sense because I wanna come alive in the purposes that You have called me to. Thank You, Lord, that You have prepared good works for us in advance to do. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I wanna pray for you in either of those two categories and say, Lord, I am Yours. Over the course of this series, work in my life, speak to me, direct my steps, establish the work of my hands, as it says in Psalm 90. Lord, I thank You for each hand that is raised, for every person who is being obedient and responsive to your calling work. I thank You, Lord, that You have called them more to just work to get paid, that You have made them for a calling to make a difference in the Kingdom of God and in the world, that what they do and how they do it would have ripple effects into eternity. So Lord, I pray that You would direct them. Give them wisdom, we pray. Fill them with Your Holy Spirit, just like 
Belzalel in, in Exodus, Lord, that Your Spirit would come for, help them to do what they do with great vigour, great passion, that people would look at them and say, wow, I need that in my life. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Lord. Let's worship.